much for this crazy world to rally a happy Lesson for me as we work through this. But let's just take a, a, a moment to, to recap where we're at. Jonah chapter 1 was the reluctant missionary. As you recall, Jonah called by God to go to preach to Nineveh. To, to the, a very simple message to Nineveh that, that destruction was coming to Nineveh as a result of their, of their sin. And Jonah rejected that message. He disobedience. He, he ran from God, is what the scripture says. He uh, aborted a, a ship headed for Tarshish, which was 2,000 miles in the other direction. And uh, God, in His grace, uh, directed, tried to direct him back towards the mission in Nineveh. Eventually, it required uh, the involvement of a big fish. And so Jonah, thrown overboard, swallowed by the fish, with the intention not of digesting him, but of, of placing him on the beach and, and uh, allowing him to move back into obedience with God. Chapter 2 then, as chapter 1 ends, he is in the belly of the fish. Chapter 2 begins, it is that three days and three nights, represented in ten verses of Jonah's in the belly of the fish experience. And it is a critical time, a great, great moment in his life and in, in the book of Jonah because it is the time of repentance. It's the time where his heart has changed, his mind has changed, and, and his way of thinking and, and, and eventually his way of acting and behavior will be changed as a result of that repentance that occurs 
in, in the, that terrible time of three days and three nights in the fish. And so we looked at Jonah, the repentant missionary. And then last week we looked at Jonah, the reset missionary. Now, in the second service last week, I remembered this on the way home. I almost got home and I, I suddenly realized I forgot the illustration. And, and I talked to Chelsea about that because the, the worship team is here for both. And, and so they get the opportunity to compare first service to second service. To see if I changed anything up or forgot anything. And I forgot my illustration. Here was my very cool illustration that I thought was terribly <laughs> unfortunate that I forgot. And, and, and here at, at Crossview, we're really familiar with the, the difficulty of texting from Crossview. Because of the, the poor signal. When we first started here four and a half years ago, there was no signal to be found. And then eventually we started finding these little hot spots around here and, and just little places where you could stand and maybe for a moment get a signal. And then, and then eventually it got to the point where I, and during, my, during this message today, during the first service, nobody knows this, but I received a text message <laughs> during the first service. And because they, the signal is greater because people in the community now have their, their little boxes in their hands. But here's the thing. God had a message to deliver and he filled in the, the two box, and that was two Nineveh. And he filled in the, the message portion, and it's a very simple message. Destruction coming to Nineveh in 40 days as a result of their sin. That was the message. He hit the send button, and the same thing that happens to us here across you happen to God. Message failed to send. <laughs> and, so, and so God was gave because God's messenger failed to send. Because Jonah failed to take that message. So God hits the resend button. In chapter 3, Jonah is ready to deliver that message. And he delivers the message in chapter 3. And all of a sudden, revival breaks out in Nineveh. People are repenting. 120,000 people come to God and, and, and repent of their sins. In fact, it is the greatest revival that appears in all of Scripture. Nowhere in the New Testament. In, in the New Testament church. And during Pentecost, during Peter's preaching, nowhere in Scripture is it recorded that so many people came to God as what did in Nineveh back when Jonah preached as the recent missionary. And then we get today to chapter 4. And this is probably the most neglected and probably the least familiar chapter of Jonah. We know the story of Jonah. We know Jonah was disobedient. We know he was swallowed by a giant fish. We know that fish coughed him up on the beach and he preached in Nineveh. And now we find chapter 4. We, we neglect this one a bit because it's kind of hard to understand. I don't mean hard to understand in that I don't know what it means. It's hard to comprehend that Jonah, the reluctant missionary... The repentant missionary, the reset missionary, suddenly becomes this whiny, petulant little child. And, and I'm going to refer to him today as the religious missionary. And I don't mean that in a good way. Not religion or religious as we would think in a positive way, but religious in a very negative way. And so we're going to walk through that today. Does it end exactly as I would have expected it to end in the book of Jonah? If I were writing the book, I say that quite often, but if I were writing Jonah, I would have chosen a different way to end it. But I believe God, in His sovereignty and His perfect knowledge, knows that this is the message that Jonah and that we need to hear. And, and what we need to, to consider, and I said this in the very beginning, don't read this simply about Jonah and understanding who Jonah was and the mistakes Jonah made. But look for yourself in, in the life of Jonah today. As we read the, the, the issues, the character flaws, the problems in Jonah today, it is important that we reflect and consider those things in our own life. And, and we look at Jonah chapter 4. If you want to turn to that in your Bible, Jonah chapter 4, we're going to look at the, 10, or the 11 verses that make up Jonah chapter 4. But before we do, let's, uh, let's pray together. Lord, thank you uh, for your word. Thank you, God, that success does not depend on uh, clever delivery or how wise I am, but depends on your word. I think of this story, the story of Jonah. Uh, Jonah was willing. He simply said your words that you gave him, and, and you accomplished great things. This morning, God... Allow me just to simply 
say the words that you've given me. And in God, you accomplish great things in that. I pray that our hearts are receptive, that they're tender, that they are uh, prepared, God, to hear what it is you have for us this morning. Lord, so that we can be changed, so that we can be molded and, and shaped into the mature followers of Christ that you want us to be. Just work in us this morning, whatever way is needed. God, there are a, a ton of different needs this morning. There are a, a bunch of people coming here with different needs, different issues, different challenges. And yet, God, you are aware of that, and you are able to meet that need in their life. Uh, accomplish that this morning, or whatever that might be. We just thank you, and we pray these things all in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs> Jonah chapter 4 says this, but to Jonah, this seemed very wrong. And now you're going to look up the screen behind you and see that is not the same. So the, the NIV that is in your pew, uh, actually words are a little different than what it is on the screen. But it's important that we see this. It says, but to Jonah, this seemed very wrong. What seemed very wrong? What seemed very wrong to him was God's mercy on the people of Nineveh. We saw all these people repenting. It says Jonah's response to that was, this seemed very wrong. And that word there, actually, very wrong, actually elsewhere in the book of Jonah and elsewhere in Scripture, actually says evil. But to Jonah, this seemed evil. That's how harshly, how badly he felt about this. How, how he, he is characterizing the work of God, the mercy and the grace and the love of God as evil in his eyes. And we're going to look at that. And what we're going to consider as we walk through this is this. There are five characteristics that are displayed by Jonah that are religious oriented, that are religious in nature. They are religion oriented as opposed to relation oriented. And, and we're going to walk through those this morning. Let's continue through it. But to Jonah, this seemed very wrong. He became angry. He prayed to the Lord, isn't this what I said, Lord, when I was still at home? That is when I tried to forestall by fleeing to Tarshish. I knew that you were gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. Now, Lord, take away my life, for it is better for me to die than to live. But the Lord replied, Is it right for you to be angry? Jonah had gone out and sat down at a place east of the city. There he made himself a shelter, sat in the shade, and waited to see what would happen to the city. Then the Lord God provided a leafy plant and made it grow up over Jonah to give shade for his head to ease his discomfort. And Jonah was very happy about the plant. But at dawn the next day, God provided a worm, which chewed the plant so that it withered. When the sun rose, God provided a scorching east wind, and the sun blazed on Jonah's head so that he grew faint. He wanted to die and said, It would be better for me to die than to live. But God said to Jonah, is it right for you to be angry about the plant? It is, he said. And I am so angry, I wish I were dead. But the Lord said, You have been concerned about this plant, though you did not tend to it or make it grow. It sprang up overnight and died overnight. And should I not have concern for the great city of Nineveh, in which there are more than 120,000 people who cannot tell their right hand from their left, and also many animals? And there's where the book of Jonah ends. Now, it's kind of a, an odd, kind of a, maybe even a, a cliffhanger kind of ending to the story. With Jonah, who, who we've seen him go through this repentance in the belly of the fish, now all of a sudden it ends with this, this whiny, ungrateful attitude. Well, I think if we look at we, this story, we, we probably are going to be maybe disappointed in the ending, disappointed in Jonah. But I think in reality, as we look through this, we're going to see that, that there's a lot of us in Jonah in this story. And it, it is characteristic of when religion takes over our life as opposed to relationship. When we begin serving religiously as opposed to serving God out of the relationship that we have. Him. You see, Jonah had, I believe, a sincere repentant experience. I don't believe that, that it was a false repentance that occurred in the belly of the fish. I think it was a sincere repentance, but it produced an insincere commitment to the work of God. His heart was not, his work was not coming from a relationship with God. It was coming from a religious duty. And we can identify that in the way he responds. Five things that he demonstrates here. And so as we look at this today, 
And we find um, Jonah's problem. I think we're going to find our problem. We're going to see that we as a church can, and as individuals who make up the church fall into these very same things. And when we see these characteristics in our life, we know this. We are headed towards serving a religion as, a, as opposed to serving God in our relationship with Him. And, and so we're going to look at those today. You see, religion, we have oftentimes think of as in a positive way. But I, I don't want us to view it in a positive way today because religion is, is really a system. It's not a relationship. In fact, I looked around to try to find a, a, a definition that, that I think really captured it. And here's what I, I found that I really liked. It said, religion is a set of man-made procedures that satisfies the heart into thinking that growth is taking place. We religiously do things. We do things just because that's the way we do things. We go through a, a, a set of rules. We follow a list. And, and we religiously do something. And if you look at the major religions of the world, they are, all have that in common. There's a set of rules. There's a way of doing things. There's a way of pleasing God that has to do with what you do and how you act. And so as Jonah lied in the belly of the fish, he was experiencing an intimacy with God. And it's very evident in that, in that chapter too. He is experiencing... The intimacy of the relationship with God and his heart is changing and his mind is changing and his behavior is beginning to change. But, but he is going to serve God now not out of in response to that relationship, not in response to the love that God has demonstrated to him, but in a religious duty that is going to be detrimental and, and harmful. He is doing what is natural for us as people. It is why the world is filled with religions. It is why religions are appealing to people. Whether it be Muslim, Buddhism, Judaism, Christianity. Whatever it is, there's, there's something appealing to, to us to have this structure to follow. And yet Christianity is far from a religion in that sense. And, and so for Jonah, he is drifting away from this intimate time with God into a set of rules and, and religious activities. And so today I want us to look at Jonah chapter 4. I want us to look at, we're going to look at five characteristics of, of religious activity. I would know we are headed into a religious experience as opposed to a relationship experience with God. And so as we look at Jonah, this isn't simply about mocking Jonah and, and, and pointing out his flaws, but looking for those same character flaws in ourselves. It's not enough just to point out his failures. It, it's important that we look for those failures in our and, and not look at other people in the church and look for those failures in your life, in their life. It's, this is a personal thing for each of us. To look at the emptiness that comes from following a religion and, and the full experience that comes from being in a relationship with God. The first thing that we're going to look at, here's the first thing with Jonah, and that is wrong motives. He begins with a wrong motive. Now, how do we know that? Well, when he sends God, when God sends him out to preach in the city, which he reluctantly does, and he goes and he preaches, the people respond to his message. God gives a very Preach these eight words. He preaches them. People respond. And his response to that was, he's upset. He's angry. I knew this was going to happen. They repented. That's just like you, God. And so his motive was never that they experienced the love and the repentance that comes from God. That was never his desire. His desire was to repent was to preach doom and destruction so that he could sit back and watch the doom and destruction. His motives were completely, completely wrong. And, and so the question is, you know, what are your motives, John? What, what is it that you wanted to happen? Why did you do what you did? Why did you preach to the, to the city if you didn't really want the city to repent and come to God? And so... We, we see him preaching judgment and then sitting back hoping that they receive judgment. And as I pointed out in the beginning, 
He describes God's mercy in a whole way, a very odd way, because he says this in Jonah's eyes. This was evil. He describes God's grace and God's mercy as evil. That's how, how mixed up he, he was in this whole thing. He is describing God's demonstration of love to the people of Nineveh as, as evil. I also don't believe he's being honest. Because he comes up with this, this thing we've never heard of. He says, you, you know what, this is why I didn't do it in the first place. This is why I refused to go because I knew that you were gracious and merciful and loving and you were going to do this anyway. That's why I didn't want to go. Well, it's interesting. We haven't heard that yet. That's the first that Jonah has brought that up in this whole story. So I don't believe he's being honest about that. But he's describing, listen to this, he's describing God's compassion, his grace, and his mercy as some kind of character flaw and some kind of weakness. I knew you were going to give in. He, he just is if that is a problem and he is demonstrating his motives were completely wrong. He had no desire to see the city repent as God did. And so, the same thing can be true about us. We can have the wrong motives. We can serve God for all the wrong reasons. And when motivation for ministry is anything other than God's love, it becomes religious activity. If you're not serving God because you love God and because you want other people to experience God's love, you're not serving in a ministry. You are simply going through religious activities in the same way that a Muslim would bow towards Mecca however well, many times a day that they would do that. A, a religious activity. That's what it becomes when we are not doing it in response to God's love or in a way of demonstrating God's love to other people. And so that can hit us really hard as Christians as we serve God and we consider why am I doing what am I, I'm doing? Why am I standing up here preaching? Am I, am I doing it for anything other than so that people will know and experience God's love? Because if I am, it's, it's a, a religious ritual. It's a religious duty. If, if you're teaching Sunday school class for anything other than, than allowing kids or for adults to grow and know Christ more. It's a religious activity. If, if anything you're doing is simply being done out of duty or, or, uh, or guilt, it's being done for the wrong motives. And that becomes religion as opposed to serving the relationship with Christ. The second thing that we see is a self-righteous attitude. Anytime that you look at somebody else and you evaluate them as deserving or in need of punishment, you are setting yourself up on the other side. And as Jonah compares himself, and it's kind of implied, but he compares himself to the people of Nineveh, the people of the Nineveh deserve punishment. Jo uh, Jonah does not. And so he is evaluating Nineveh compared to himself. And he himself, in his view, is good enough. I've got enough goodness, even if it's even if it's not complete goodness, I've got enough to earn God's favor, to earn God's grace. And, and the people of Nineveh do not. Religion shows up that way. With a self-righteousness that, that believes that your own goodness is sufficient. Jonah's own goodness was more important than God's grace in Jonah's view. And so... And, and so, he, as I said, he even goes on to describe God's characters in a negative way. I knew you were gracious. I knew you were compassionate merciful, and merciful. I knew this is what you were going to do. Characterizing it in a, in, a, in a bad way. But any time that we look at others as not good enough, we are ultimately saying that we are, in fact, good enough. That I've got just enough good in me to earn God's favor. And yet the Bible says that there are none that are good. You know, if we ever look at others in the world and we look at them simply as this, they are not good enough to receive God's mercy. If you ever think that about anybody, you look around your community and, and, and the people that you, you see as most uh, sinful and despicable. If you look around the world and you look at anyone and you say they are beyond God's love, they are beyond God's mercy, you have entered into self-righteousness. 
Because any time that you have put someone else in that position, you have put yourself in a position of being good enough. And, and Jonah was in that situation. Religion negates the need for God's grace and trust in our own goodness. Religion negates the need for God's grace and trust in its own goodness. You know, every other form of religion in the world is self-righteous based. Every other relation or, or every religion that you would point out to me other than Christianity is based on works, on being good enough. And our faith system, Christianity, is based on grace, on the fact that I can't be good enough. And religion leads us into self-righteous actions and self-righteous behavior. The next thing is the problem of pride. Jonah has showed a lot of great pride here. And I think, really, it turns out to be one of the major stumbling blocks for him. And it's reviewed. It out in, um, he just went out into the streets and met him on his preaching destruction. Forty days, the city's going to be destroyed. He has marched through the city proclaiming that. And now, God's relenting on that. God's going to do something different. He's going to save the people. <coughs> He's going to save the city of Nineveh. So all of a sudden, from Jonah's perspective, I have put my neck out of there. I have walked all over the city. I have predicted judgment and destruction. And now you're going to relent on it? I'm going to look like an idiot. I just walked all over this town telling people it was going to be destroyed and now you're going to let up on it. I really think one of his biggest problems here is he's afraid he's going to look bad. I, my credibility's been damaged because I told everybody that it's going to burn and now you're letting him off the hook. He was more concerned with saving face than he was with saving souls. That was his, his problem. He really cared more about his reputation than he did for lost people. Even to the point of this, I would rather die. That's what he says. He keeps going back to that. That's like his ace in the hole. And so, and so he is so embarrassed, I would rather die than to show my face in this town again. He, his pride has got a hold of him. And, and religion is more concerned with how we appear than what we are truly accomplishing for God. But think about that. Religion is more concerned with how we will appear to others than what we are truly accomplishing for God. That can be that can hit kind of both close to home. We can, as a church, get so concerned with how the rest of the community views us and sees us, that that becomes our motivation. That becomes what drives us to ministry. It's a pride element. We want to cross you to look good in the community. And so, so we're going to do lots of stuff. And we're going to be really visible so that people speak highly of the church. And, and, and Jonah didn't want to look bad in the community. We can so get so concerned about that, how this activity is going to look, how it's going to reflect on me, you know, I can, I can fall into the trap of, of, of being more concerned about what people think about me and whether they think I'm a, a good pastor or a good speaker or a clever illustrator. I mean, whatever it is, that can become more important to me than actually accomplishing mission, actually accomplishing ministry. And that is religious activity. That is not truly serving God. And we don't limit it just inside the church to one another. We can do it in our community. We can be so concerned about getting a big half-page article in the Daily News about the new building that's going on across you than we can about what is actually being accomplished for God in our community. That is religion. And, and that is truly dangerous. But the real tragedy of that whole thing is that Instead of winning people to Christ, instead of accomplishing the mission of, of building disciples for Christ, 
we are moving towards a show, a demonstration for other people. We have, we have traded, or we can trade off effective ministry for a good performance. <laughs> that is religion, and, and that is dangerous for the church. The next thing that Jonah describes and displays is an ungrateful attitude, ingratitude. In fact, we get, we get to this kind of weird switch in the story where he's up on the hill and, and we get this plant growing. But it seems, this seems to be the case. Jonah has gone for a place with a good vantage point. Even to the point he says he wants to see what God's going to do. It doesn't seem like he's absolutely certain that God's going to relent and, and, and allow these people to, to live. He's going to, to get a good seat up on the hillside and watch what God's going to do. And probably from what I read here, it sounds like he's still hoping for lightning bolts. And so he, he's gone, he's built a little shack, uh, got ready for the show, and, and all of a sudden, here comes this plant God grows up out of the ground. This large plant with big leaves that, that grows up over him and provides shade for him. I was reading, kind of doing some research on it, and it says that the castor oil plant grows very uh, prolifically in that climate. And it has leaves that are anywhere from 6 to 18 inches long, and it will grow up to 40 feet tall. And, and, and it's a, kind of a vine thing that really provides a lot of shade. And so some people speculate that it was the castor oil plant, which I think Jonah, if you know anything about castor oil, Jonah could have used a little bit of that in this whole experience. <laughs> Seeing seem there was some kind of extra problem going on there. <laughs> but he, 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 he gets under this plant and he enjoys the shade of it. But it isn't shade that he did anything to, to earn. He did nothing to make it grow. God simply provided it to him. And so God is teaching him a lesson. He's going to demonstrate something to him. So overnight, worm comes along, chews off the bottom of the, of the vine, and it dies. Next day, plants go on it, and Jonah is just, oh, this is unbelievable. My shade is gone. And, and, and God points out to him, yeah, he didn't do anything for that. Jonah is incredibly ungrateful. And it shows something. I want you to consider what he's comparing here. He is ungrateful that God graciously gave him this shade, even if it was only for a day. And yet he is standing back, waiting for the city to be destroyed because he does not want them to experience the grace that God wants to give to the people of Nineveh. Jonah, for Jonah, he deserved God's blessing over God's mercy for Nineveh. He deserved that blessing. None of them, Nineveh did not deserve the grace of God according to Jonah. And so somehow it seems he has come to think that the good things that are coming his way are a product of himself. That he has, he has earned these things. That he deserves this plant as he sits and, and, and watches for what God's about ready to do in the Nineveh. Jonah is essentially saying this. I deserve shade. Nineveh deserves destruction. What an incredible trade-off. And so it leads up to a, a very dangerous and common thought process in religion. And that is, religion fails to see that if not for God's mercy, we would all be recipients of God's wrath. The truth is, if Jonah were honest about it, he didn't deserve, not only did he not deserve the plan, he didn't deserve to live. He was just as, as worthy of God's wrath and destruction as the people of Nineveh. He didn't see that. And the same thing is true about us. We're looking around the rest of the world and we're thinking that there are people that are more worthy of God's wrath and destruction than us, then we are in dangerous territory. We are walking on the eggshells of religion. Because we need to understand that there's not one of us, me above all, who aren't deserving of God's wrath. It is only by God's grace and mercy that any of us uh, have eternal life. Or, or even live today. And so religion doesn't see that. When we begin to think others deserve God's wrath and God's anger, um, we have ventured way off the farm. When we think 
that there are all kinds of people that are more worthy of God's punishment in ourselves than, than we have really trekked far away from true Christianity. You know, but if it, if it wasn't for God's grace, I would be ducking lightning bolts this morning. And, and we need to understand that is true about every one of us. The final characteristic here, and this one really, to me, hits home in the church today. And it is self-centeredness. Joe Jonah is dis- displaying incredible self-centeredness. And I believe it's one that we really need to consider today. And that is personal comfort. How important is my personal comfort? Look at Jonah here. Sitting on the hill. And he is upset because it is too hot. The sun is too hot. Now, I think what is described there is probably sort of like a desert experience. I think it was a really horrible experience. I think it was incredibly hot. And, and, and a horrible wind that would be blowing if you were looking at the desert. But I think it wasn't just a simply, you know, it's, it's a little warm in here. I think he was really in a difficult situation. But nonetheless, he is, he is concerned about personal comfort. And there are people that are sitting there ready to receive destruction. And he's upset that he doesn't have shade and they're not getting destruction. It is a completely self-centered view of God and of, of faith. And I think probably the saddest testimony in, in this story. He sits here ready to see the, watch the city be destroyed. And his main concern to God is, you know, could you crank the air conditioning up a little bit? And, and here's an opportunity he has. To watch the love of God extended to a, a people who are lost and doomed for eternal destruction. He's got an opportunity for to see them experience love of God, repentance, mercy, grace. And he is more concerned that it is a little warm for him. That is really probably the saddest thing in this. Jonah's personal comfort was more important to him than God's kindness to others. It's one of the great dangers, I believe, in the church today. Churches become more and more self-focused. Become more and more concerned about our own comfort, our own wants, our own needs, our own desires. What's going to make us happy as people. And, and we, we can create this little, this little club, this little fun time together that, that focuses simply on getting our own needs met. And in doing that, completely neglecting the lost world that, that needs Christ. And I really believe that it's one of the, the great things that are part of the church today. And it's why we as a, as a people, we as a church, need to really, really be on guard for that. That we not be so self-focused and so self-absorbed and, and concerned by our own comfort that we're ignoring people and needs. People that are, are doomed for hell apart from God. And we fall into a religious trap when our focus becomes about us instead of those who are outside of our fellowship. Those who are outside of the fellowship of God. And so we look at these five descriptions of, of Jonah, but frankly it's more appropriately five descriptions of, of us from time to time, or all the time. But it really kind of is an interesting story because Jonah has come out of the belly of the fish repentant, but religious. And we see that in this case as a very, a very dangerous situation. He needs repentance, but he needs repentance to trust in the relationship of Jesus to transform the way he acts and, and the way he behaves in the way he thinks. And it's really this strange thing because it kind of leaves us up in the air. We're not certain what if Jonah came around or not. We don't know if he it came to him one day and he, he, he suddenly, when he saw these people coming to God, that he, he was like, oh goodness, what was I thinking? Doesn't tell us that. Doesn't tell us if he, he got it right. Now, Jesus speaks of Jonah in the New Testament, so maybe there's an indication there that Jonah truly understood and repented at some time. But I believe maybe part of the reason 
that it was part of God's plan to leave this open-ended, not simply for Jonah's benefit, but for our benefit. So it ends with the question for us is, did, did Jonah dump religion and seek the relationship? And, it, and, and, and so that open-ended question then is transferred to us. Do we dump religion and seek the relationship? That is the key. That is the key to living in obedience to God and faithfulness to His mission that He has given us. And so, are we as a church doing that? Are we falling into the trap of religious duty and, and, and religious responsibility? Are we serving God out of the relationship that we have with Christ in love in response to His love is that our motivation for serving God and serving the world are we going to trust in religion this is the final question for you today are we going to trust in religion or the life changing relationship that comes from Jesus let's pray Father thank you for your word and thank you God just for directing us through this time today Pray, Lord, that the story of Jonah does not become just simply something for our memory to, to call up and, and tell to our kids or our grandkids. But God, it is a story that reveals much about our own hearts and our own lives. Help us, Lord, to, to come to you in, in an intimate relationship that transforms the way we live and, and, it, and transforms the way we serve the world, the way we demonstrate your love to others, God that we would never fall into the religious ritual and trap, God, that religion brings. As we close today, God, speak to our hearts in whatever way is needed, whatever way is necessary. And uh, we thank you. And we pray these things all in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to close this morning uh, with uh, our, our communion service. And we'd like to share from 1 Corinthians chapter 11, what Paul had to say uh, regarding uh, regarding uh, the, the, the Lord's Supper. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, beginning at verse 23. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus on the night he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. Whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So then, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. Everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For those who eat and drink without discerning the body of Christ, eat and drink judgment on themselves. Here there are four reasons why we participate, why we partake of the Lord's Supper, the, the, uh, the sacrament of communion. And the first is it was commanded by Jesus. Jesus said, do this. And so we simply today do it because he told us to. The second thing is he says to do this in remembrance of me. And so we partake of the Lord's Supper as a, as a means of reflecting, remembering the sacrifice that Christ made. It's a reminder to us. Uh, it creates a, a picture that, that reminds us of Jesus' sacrifice. The third thing is, he says, whenever you do this, you are proclaiming the Lord's death and resurrection until he returns. You are proclaiming your, you are proclaiming the gospel to the world and to one another when you participate in the Lord's Supper. And finally, he says, it's an act of examination. It's a time to look at our own heart, to discern whether or not our heart is right with God, and, and not to keep us from participating, but to allow us to seek... Um, Seek the, the uh, forgiveness and, and move forward. Repentance, forgiveness, and move forward in obedience to God. So it is an act of obedience. It's an act of remembrance. It's an act of proclamation. And it is an act of examination.
Christ invites all those who repent of their sins, who place their faith in His person and saving work on the cross, and who remain in the fellowship of the church to come to His table. We do so looking back with thanksgiving for His atoning death on the cross to forgive our sins, as well as looking forward with anticipation to His promised return for His bride, so we can celebrate together the Lord's Supper. So we invite all who know Christ and are a part of His church to participate with us in His presence. The leadership team would come up at this time. We will pass the others. Oh, oh, oh. 
this in remembrance of me. We desire to partake of the Lord's Supper. Having exercised saving faith in Christ, we now receive the bread and cup. As indicated in these words of Scripture, I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let us pray. Father, we do thank you for your incredible love that sent Jesus to come to this earth to live a holy and perfect life, to explicitly die on a cross, Lord, for each and every one of us. We thank you, God, for that immeasurable love. We thank you, God, for that grace and that mercy that sent Jesus to the cross. Today, Lord, we reflect on that. We remember that. We thank you, God, for that love and that sacrifice. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Take and eat, remembering and believing that the body of Christ was broken for us, his bride, to provide complete forgiveness of all our sins. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup. You proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let us drink. Father, thank you today for the fellowship that comes from the unity of your spirit, Lord. The blessing that comes from following Christ. Lord, we thank you today for your grace and your mercy and your love. We thank you, God, that you love all people. And that there's no one beyond your love. And we thank you, God, today that we have the, the blessing to participate in this act of remembrance. We thank you and we pray these things all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's all stand and uh, we're going to close one more time. Here.
out of, out of the reverence to you, Lord. And in response to your love and your grace that you demonstrated to us, God, that we would serve you in that manner. But God, we would throw away the pretense of religion and serve you fully in the relationship, God, that you have given to us. Thank you today. Lord, as we go from here, uh, just enable us, empower us, help us, Lord, to, to serve you fully and, uh, and accomplish the mission, God, that you've given to us, not just as cross you, but as individuals serving you, Lord. We thank you. We love you. And we pray these things all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you.